Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have uh, two popular green methodologies. One is the cradle to cradle uh, protocol, which we have discussed uh, uh, earlier. And the second one is the emission trading. The emission trading is the one that we are going to look at now. In the emission trading, what you are doing is you, this is you, which is producing the gases, and you want to claim this, convert this into this that is uh, you know as though then what you do is you offset credits. So, let us see how this is done. So, the basic principle of emission trading is suppose there are two firms x and y that are polluting the atmosphere and the country wants to decrease the overall level of pollution and band aids both firms reduce the amount of pollutants they emit into the atmosphere. So, there is a regulation that says you should reduce both both for x and y and the cost of emission reduction might differ markedly for these two firms. So, firm x might be able to reduce its emissions at a much lower cost than y because we, it could be x and y are in different industries and it is possible that uh, to, to reduce the percentage of emissions for x, it may cost much less than for y. So, the difference in the cost of emissions reduction creates a market opportunity. Now, there are two, both of them are regulated to reduce their this one, but to reduce the carbon emissions of one, it costs much less than the other. So, what you could do is the firms that could reduce the same amount of total emissions at a lower cost, if firm X reduces more than what it has to and sells the extra reduction to firm Y at a cost lower than the cost of emissions of reduction to Y. In other words, you know it is a win win if you can if you can sell supposing X it is since it is cheaper it instead of it, if it is asked to reduce by 30 percent it reduces by 40 percent because it is cheaper to reduce it and it is feeling it is beating its uh, its own goal by the government regulations and it has 10 percent extra credits. So, that it can sell to Y and Y instead of reducing it to th by 30 percent, it can reduce by 20 percent. So, the it should be the cost X charges to Y should be less than what Y has to pay to the uh, to the regulator. So, basically it is a it is a simple principle of uh, trading where uh, you know one company where it is cheaper to reduce the emissions does more than what it is required and then sells the saved credits to this. Firm X will gain because of the difference between the cost of emission reduction of firm, firm X and firm Y and firm Y will gain for the same reason. So, well, I mean it is obvious that for x uh, uh, whatever it gets from y should be more than what it spends in reducing the uh, the emissions and of course, for y it should buy cheaper from x than it has to pay the, the regulator. So, it has to be a win win situation for both. So, there is what is called cap and trade that is regulatory bodies establish a cap called emission cap on the level of emissions permitted in a jurisdiction. The participants in the program receive credits distributed sometimes uh, given sometimes purchased through a auction by regulatory authorities which correspond to the amount of pollution defined as the number of tons of pollutants in a year and they are expected allowed to emit within any year. So, I mean this is basically a regulation this one. If they exceed the cap, they have to pay a tax. 
they have to buy credits from other participants. So hence total pollution is limited to the total amount of cap and trading allows for an efficient allocation of pollution as, as those participants who can reduce emissions in a cost effective way will do so and benefit from trading with those who cannot. So basically it is this cap and trade is the same thing as we were discussed between X and Y. Here there is a government limit and you have to follow that limit and you can buy the credits from, from others who could do it cheaper. So if you are looking at an example there are two power plants and power plant A emits uh, 100 tons of CO2 and plant B emits 200 tons of CO2. So the total emissions are 300 tons. So the CO2 emission is 300 tons. Now the government steps in and says it puts a cap of 210 tons of CO2 total, 30 percent reduction. Both plants have to decrease the pollutants, the pollution by 30 percent. A can emit only 70 tons of CO2 and B 140 tons of CO2. And the cost of reduction of 1 ton of CO2 for a plant A is 20 dollars for the first 30 units and 50 dollars for plant B for the first 60, 60 units. So if the plants A and B reduce pollution separately, the total cost of emissions for 210 tons will be because A has to reduce by 30 and it costs 20 dollars per ton that is 20 into 30 whereas for B it has to reduce by 60 and it costs $50 for the plant B. So, this is $3600. So, if they do it independently. Now, you can always find that here that uh, the A it is it has to reduce by 30 units and it costs only $20 whereas for B it has to reduce by 60 units and it costs $50 for the plant. So, you can see it costs it costs more for B to uh, uh, to reduce the this one. So, there is an opportunity here for A to reduce more and sell it to B that is what it does. So, plant A is able to reduce emissions at a lower cost than plant B and if it can reduce more than 30 units it can sell permits to the plant B. I mean this is allowed and people have made lot of money in the, in the cap and trade scheme. There are companies who basically advise you on this it is like stock market trading. And if plant A reduces 60 tons of CO2 at 20, the plant B could reduce 30 tons at 50 implying that the total cost of production of 210 will be 20 into 60, 60 plus 30 into 50 that is 2700 which is less than 3600. I think this, this is a simple mathematics which shows that instead of 3600 each paying independently if the both of them combine and then it will be 2700. Then A can sell the extra 30 at a cost between 20 and 50 because B will not buy if it is 50 because he, he can reduce it himself. But on the other hand A cannot sell below 20 so it has to be between 20 and 50 and get a profit for the extra emissions. B also benefits that the average cost of reducing emissions is lower than 50. So, A and B could be in different continents. So, basically the, the about the cap and trade the idea is the, the global universe is the same. So, you can produce emissions in one part of the world and reduce the emissions and do, do uh, the cap trade in another part of the world. So, this is the kind of the cap and trade that uh, is being done and uh, it is it is very popular 
uh, trading scheme. And so, uh, there are what are called offsets. A carbon offset is another type of commodity that represents the reduction of one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent by qualifying carbon reduction project. So, the carbon offset may or may not represent the actual reduction of CO2 emissions. Examples of offset include renewable power generation, energy efficiency projects and forestry and industry waste remediation. So, see you can reduce the one with the earlier cap and trade is if you are generating emissions then you have to re reduce the emissions someplace that is one way of doing it. But the other offset is you can do some other energy efficient project like solar some somewhere else in the world or windmill and get the credit for that in terms of uh, the renewable power generation. So, in other words you can have a cement plant, you pollute the atmosphere in one part of the world and have a solar uh, plant in somewhere else and you can offset the credits. So, there are no, there are governing bodies that attempt to ensure offsets are real and accounted properly because you know you are trying to, uh, trying to match uh, apples and tomatoes here. In other words, your, uh, your carbon from a cement plant you want to offset to a solar power in the other. So, some body in between a regulatory body has to decide uh, what it means. in terms of uh, um, offset. So, a renewable energy certificate can be converted into carbon offsets by proving the renewable energy generated actually offsetting an equivalent amount of carbon based electricity production. So, if you are doing say renewable energy like solar or a windmill and if you are generating so many megawatts of, of uh, electricity, you have to see same as to generate same amount of electricity either through coal or some other uh, fuel, then you have to see how much of carbon you, you will spend and that is going to be your offsets. So, there has to be some standardization and conversion of these offsets and so on. This seems to be the one that is that is going on now. So, basically the emission trading, it is a trading you know this there is the basically it is half scientific and half marketing and trading into the market. So, basically you can go to a, a stock exchange and trade your carbon offsets and uh, that, that business goes, goes on. So, what we have seen so far is that there are two ways of uh, in which you can design your green supply chains. One way is to look at the cradle to cradle protocol. You are doing all the hard work with your uh, uh, suppliers, with your manufacturing plants, redesign your products so that uh, you know they are recyclable, recyclable and you are reducing your carbon uh, generation in your manufacturing processes. You are using <coughs> the, your distribution or uh, your transportation which is with minimal carbon footprint and your distribution centers are all either solar or, or minimal, minimal carbon footprint and so you take several of these steps and that is the first step of cradle to cradle protocol which is basically a very scientific way of reducing the real carbon emitted into the atmosphere. The other one which is a marketing jargon which came in, in the Kyoto protocol uh, is that you can trade your carbon. Now, when you are trading, trading your carbon is it real carbon if you are generating uh, carbon 
and you trade off with uh, with the same body in the same vertical industry then probably you are saving the atmosphere. That is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it instead of there are offsets instead of the carbon you generate you produce some uh, some other factory which actually saves the uh, the carbons and you try to offset it. So, there are various kinds of schemes that are possible and when you are designing your supply chain it is important that you consider both schemes. Since carbon tra trading is legal and it is allowed you need not have to spend all your time on cradle to cradle protocol redesigning your products, redesigning your processes and so on. You can see a part of the time, part of your effort into where you can trade. Maybe if you have factory somewhere and then you want to start a, a, a solar factory there with uh, if it is in a hot climate and if it has 12 hours of sun every day then maybe it, it may make sense for you to start a factory there and then use those credits there. So, the, the supply chain design is basically if you are designing network design you have to take both these into account. That is what our definition of uh, the green supply chain is. So, it is a strategically designed inter organizational network. GSCN is Global Green Supply Chain Network is a strategically designed inter-organizational network delivering green products designed and produced environmentally friendly green procurement manufacturing strategic processes. So, you have designed a green product, you are producing that product, your procurement, your manufacturing, your distribution and other thing is you have taken care that you are minimizing your carbon credits and deliver low carbon footprint products or solutions to your customers. So, in other words you produce this and you deliver it to your customers and reduce resource usage and pollutants following the cradle and cradle protocol and encouraging re-innovations. What are the re-innovations? Reuse, repair, recycle and there are the forward SCN the supply chain network and the backward SCN network reverse, reverse logistics are all in place. The backward supply chain network is the one from the consumer once it dumps the product as disposes the product you want to recycle, reuse and all that that is the backward supply chain and there is the reverse logistics like B 2 B, B 2 C logistics which takes the products in the forward direction. You have the reverse logistics which basically takes the products in the reverse direction once it is disposed of and reverse logistics is basically very very difficult thing because you the, uh, the uncertainty of the disposal and so on. and minimal carbon footprint using efficient trading mechanisms. So, I think when once you have the supply chain all your operations you should look at not only the design of the green supply chain which is with the minimal uh, CO2 generation. You should also look at the carbon footprint using efficient trading mechanisms. In other words, can you use efficient trading mechanisms where you can save money? In other words, if you are having very efficient processes, so can you trade some of the carbon that you have saved? Or will it make economic sense for you to trade by the carbon credits from somewhere else instead of going through your processes which are basically uh, not carbon efficient? So, you there is always the balance of reducing the carbon as we have seen in the numerical examples you are reducing the carbon emissions may be very expensive and you can buy trade them very easily. So, it all depends. So, basically the design of your uh, network 
you have to consider all the factors both the cradle uh, the cradle to cradle protocol as well as the efficient trading mechanisms the the green supply chain functioning is coordinated and executed so that it outcomes conforms to the objectives of the triple bottom line sustainability economic development and social well being so basically the, your objectives of the global supply chain are the same it is the triple bottom line sustainability you want to uh, produce products and uh, you want to save the future for future generations and all that but the important thing is you follow two points first one is the cradle to cradle protocol in your design manufacturing distribution etc and also in the reverse logistics the second one is the trading so you can use both so having having seen this before we get into the design of uh, uh, the green supply chains uh, this one i thought it is better we look at what is the industry practice that that is happening in the industry today in other words what is the state of uh, uh, the industry we are talking of the of the green practices uh, this one so basically let's look at what are the initiatives in practice what's happening in the industry so low carbon innovations are not just new products and technologies they also include new services and processes such as the information and communication technologies chemicals and materials agriculture law accounting and consulting in other words if you want to use this in other words suppose you are somebody you want to use the green supply chain innovations what are the kinds of things that that you could do in this the dutch flower industry for example has cultivates flowers in rock wool and transports them in trays reducing shipping time and cost so what they do is they basically in the the flowers in rock wool in the stuff of the sand in the, in the stuff of the soil and it is all in parts and parts are exported by by themselves so you need to have to uh, take the take the part out uh, the 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 flower out and then see that it doesn't uh, get uh, tarnished or spoiled and so on but what you do is to uh, to basically uh, put it in rock wool and transport by as the parts themselves so that you will save a lot of time and shipping cost that's uh, basically uh, one of the innovations that they do and uh, they are saving they are saving lot of carbon in this because uh, you know they don't use pesticides they don't use fertilizers and so on and they use in their rock well and best buy partnered with ge to bring new home energy management systems smart appliances and renewable energy products to market them more rapidly see best buy uh, ge has brought out this and the home energy management systems and so on so they are bringing out the products for for the electrical products yes. and morrison and forrester llp began law practice focused on clean technology offering corporate and litigation services along the technical expertise in intellectual property energy environmental laws billings grew from 6 million in 2006 to 100 million in 2011 now i mean you can see there are lot of people who want to make an opportunity in this one thing is you like in trading we are seeing that you can you can trade you can basically convert uh, the offsets and so on so what if if there is a legal issue who is going to defend you in the court so somebody has started this legal practice it's a focused on clean technology offering corporate litigation services so somebody can say it is a green product and it is not a green product supposing your supplier says he will supply you a green product he doesn't supply what do you do you have to go uh, to the law so is there a law firm which is an expert on this it's no 
So, this is happening like in the in the IT industry today you know for example, you have lot of uh, uh, social media that are coming up like Facebook, uh, like LinkedIn and so on. So, I mean when you are in LinkedIn, when you are talking with your friends, you think it is uh, you think it is confidential or you think it is not public. So, but it is public. So, basically there are litigations that, that come in and the people have to be careful about this. So, particularly since green is not so very well defined right now and it is a new thing. It is possible somebody says it is green, your definition of green is different from my definition of green. We are going to look at uh, this is an important thing because supposing my definition of green is less carbon and your definition of is uh, of, uh, of green is less use of less energy. So, there could be some differences. So, there is a law of practice that was focused on this and automakers adopting new start stop battery mechanisms from Johnson controls that turn off vehicles engines off rather than idle when the vehicle stops. So, there, there, there are several of these things which are coming up which saying that it, the vehicle stops instead of for this one and it immediately starts once you, once you release the brake. So, there are several green supply chain innovations which are coming up. So, it need not be, I mean the, the reason why I am showing this is the reason it need not have to be always a manufacturing production process, a supply chain and so on. But there is a supply chain behind each of these products to create green supply chains or a service like a uh, law and so on. But these, these products are created so that ultimately they save the, the carbon credits. So, green delivery is the is video conferencing system. For example, it avoids substitutes for many forms of business travel. HP and its customers saved 666,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gas emissions in 2 years and HP reduced its employee business travel by 43 percent. So, each employee has a carbon credit count that depends on his, his, his basically the office, the energy he consumes in the office the mode of transportation that he uses from house to uh, to office and return and also his office travel. So, basically by using a video conferencing system companies are saving. SAP introduced carbon impact on demand 5.0 carbon management software leading to 1.3 billion enterprise carbon accounting marketplace. So, if you are a company, how do you find out what is your carbon this one? So, SAP has introduced a software and this can be used and it is basically a very good move. And HP works with corporate customers to design, implement and manage an imaging and printing infrastructure. For one customer with 10,000 employees, HP reduced printing energy consumption by 66 percent. Fortune 500 companies could avoid 2.3 million metric tons of carbon dioxide annually by reducing printing. So, if you are using a printer and if you want to reduce the printer uh, printing, then uh, you know you could you could do that by. Uh, uh, by avoiding printing, use email and other uh, methods. For low carbon innovations to take root, companies must develop the necessary network for external partners that enable them. See, there is a co-evolution that goes on for any of these kind of innovations. You know, we have seen earlier that the innovation in global global supply chains is by outsourcing and then low cost uh, outsourcing to uh, basically regulatory uh, uh, restrictions removal to delivery mechanisms and all that. Similarly, if you want the green delivery to take green products uh, to take root, 
companies must develop the necessary networks of external partners to enable them. It is not enough if you gen just generate the product and you should find out how to co-evolve from this. So basically the next uh, the, this one is we have seen what are the some of the innovations and so on. Let us look at a company where like a cement uh, company which is uh, Samax and, and sustainability innovations on this. So the reason for looking at uh, Samax is that it is a cement company which is a highly uh, carbon intensive uh, company and uh, it basically em <coughs> emits a lot of gases into the atmosphere and what are the kinds of initiatives that they are doing. One thing is to look at the innovations <coughs> like SAP's uh, software for carbon print, uh, footprint and uh, the, the innovations of uh, the other companies. But Another, another thing is how is the actual reduction taking place uh, by uh, these companies like Samex. So let us look at that. So Samex is what are the sustainability innovations in this? You know Samex is a, uh, uh, is a cement company and cement industry is unconventional and low tech. Well, it is used in building construction, it has no high technology and stands out as an emerging economy chain. In other words, it is from Mexico and it is the third largest, it has become uh, in no time. And it is the best practice model since late 1980s it has grown rapidly uh, from a local cement uh, producer in Mexico to the larger, uh, to third largest cement company in the world. So basically it has made. Uh, tremendous amount of uh, progress. The success of the company is because it has built superior information and logistics capabilities, excellent business models and an efficient supply chain with risk green, risk green operating practices. So basically the, if you look at uh, the, the supply chain here in this. What is, the, what is there you know you ta start with clicker and then try to heat it up and then make cement and uh, you know this is the model and it is a high temperature and it was uh, emanates lot of gases into this. How are you going to reduce this or how do you make up what are the sustainability practices because there, there are two issues here. One is the price of cement is low, it is a commodity product. And this, if you say a cement company, it is not a uh, uh, you know high profile company that this one. And the second thing is the government regulates the price at a low level because the infrastructure, the house building and everything needs cement and it cannot, they cannot increase the prices as they like. It is the prices are regulated. And second thing is the communities, communities are basically as state if the uh, the cement plant is is in their neighborhood because they know it, it uh, emanates sulfur dioxide and all the poisonous gases and also it spoils, spoils the atmosphere and it ultimately affects the health of the residents. So because of all these reasons that uh, Semex has, what are the kinds of initiatives that such a company should do so that it A satisfies the government. B, it satisfies the communities and C, it actually produces at the price that, that is in the market because cement is such a uh, commodity product, you cannot increase the price because it is green cement. So what are Semex offerings? I mean Semex basically has grown into global building solutions. What Semex does in this instead of cement, it says it will offer building solutions that provide products that's consistently high quality and reliable service to customers and communities in Americas, Europe, Africa and Middle East and Asia. So first thing it did was instead of just cement, it offers all the building solutions. 
build and sell with all the building materials like steel and others. It may not manufacture the steel, it manufactures cement, but it procures this, the other materials like gravel and uh, the, uh, the steel and others and orchestrates so that it basically supplies to various distributors. And the operation network, uh, operations network produces, distributes and markets cement, ready mix, concrete, aggregates and related building materials to customers in over 500, 50, 50 countries. So, basically it is a, com it's a co company that is doing very well at the uh, market cement ready mix, uh, concrete aggregates and other building materials uh, globally. <coughs> so, what is the carbon footprint of cement? The production of cement is carbon intensive requiring high temperature sintering of limestone, clay, iron oxide to create clinker, the basic material for cement. So, it takes limestone, clay and uh, iron oxide to create clinker and from clinker you get the cement and basically it is a high temperature sintering process. And the heating process takes place in large rotary skill kilns that reach temperatures of 1400 degrees centigrade to catalyze proper chemical reactions. So, you can see the, the complexity here you have you have to generate these temperatures. So, you need fuel to get up to these temperatures. So, whatever the fuel is basically if you are using uh, whatever fuel you are using and to get it to for 1400 you generate lot of gases. And also during the chemical reactions of making this particular product from limestone to cement or clay or clinker, you are going to reduce lot of poisonous gases and of course, there are remnants which pollute. So, both the fuel requirements of the kilns and the reaction processes result in significant releases of CO2 into the atmosphere. So, you require fuel for the kill as well as the reaction processes, both of them will generate lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and so, it is a, a complicated thing how to reduce. The cement industry as a whole represents 5 percent of all carbon emissions associated with human activity, an issue that has spurred widespread effort to reduce the carbon footprint of cement production. So, 5 percent of the total carbon emissions are from cement. So, that is where it becomes very important to, to talk about this. Although, although you see the point here is it is a commodity industry and in the commodity industry you cannot you cannot you do not spend lot of money because you cannot increase the price. You cannot say it is green cement and charge more. So, that is where the importance of uh, doing things well in this particular this one. So, what are the sustainability initiatives? I mean, I have given you the background of the industry and what are the initiatives that CEMEX has taken? CEMEX has three main sustainability objectives. It is enhance its value creation. CEMEX aims to deliver the innovative high performance products, services and solutions to the resource constrained society requires building requires for building a low carbon economy that is the value creation, manage its carbon footprint, it strives to minimize the ecological impacts of the operations of the communities and engage stakeholders. As I said before, it is not enough if you are green, your stakeholders, your society, your people should be green. You know, for example, if you if you can make your clinker which is green, but then what about the transportation? 
to the customers then it has to be green. So, basically if you it is it's, it's high, with highly committed and empowered employees CIMEX closely collaborates with a variety of institutions with complementary core competencies to strengthen the local communities. So, what is the carbon strategy of uh, CIMEX? The carbon strategy is is designed a carbon strategy to help reduce the environmental impacts of its operations while creating economic value and driving the construction industry's participation in the development of low carbon economy. So, there are two things it is doing. One is it is trying to reduce the value of its operations, the problems with its operations and also it is trying to help con con construction industry as a whole where CIMEX belongs, the, it is trying to create value and it is driving the construction industry's participation in the development of low carbon economy. The key components of strategy are reduce ecological footprint of our production process replacing traditional fossil fuels with low emission alternatives. reducing the clinker content in cement because evidently that gives you a lot of less carbon this one. Increasing our use of renewable electricity and other energy efficiency of operations because it requires a lot of electric power and energy that use, use renewable energy in this. Aligning operations and initiatives with international standards, regulations and market based mechanisms for emissions reductions. So, whatever people are doing, whatever are the standards ISO 14000, whatever they are following the this kind of standards. So, let us look at uh, what, what they are trying to do here. So, the carbon footprint tool, they have developed a carbon footprint tool, a key pillar of our CO2 reduction efforts is our carbon footprint tool that helps us quantify the direct and indirect account of CO2 emitted during the production process of cement, concrete and aggregates up until the product leaves our facilities. So, well the popular belief is unless you can measure you cannot control, what you cannot measure you cannot control. So, here you have to have a carbon footprint tool for your kiln and all the operations till from end to end. In other words, you get you get the various raw materials, uh, you fire them up in your rotary kiln and finally get the clinker and make them into, into cement and then concrete and aggregates and slabs and all that. So, when it leaves your factory up to that, what is the carbon footprint? And now then look at how to how to reduce this. So, there is this this uh, this one that uh, CEMEX follows is waste to value. CEMEX carbon strategy is to reduce the environmental impacts of its operations as well as to drive the development of low carbon economy from waste to value. How does it do? CEMEX uses residues or byproducts from industrial, domestic, agriculture and forestry processes to fuel cement facilities. So, it uses this whatever garbage, the municipal garbage as well as the agriculture and domestic and forestry processes, everything to fire up its plants. For example, the some of the materials that are some of the, the ways include used tires, spent solvents, wasted oil, waste oils, processed municipal, municipal solid waste, household waste, agriculture wastages such as rice, peanut shells and coffee husk and animal meal, sewage sludge and so on. So, basically all these things are being used these are the outputs of various processes in the households, in the cities and so on 
it is using it as a fuel. So this is following the biological principle of the waste of one animal is the food for another animal. It is the same thing that the waste of municipal waste is used as a fuel for for cements. So the process reduces reliance on fossil fuels. And CEMEX uses alternative fuels increased, the alternate use 27.1 percent of the total fuel mix. It has increased by, by 7 percent. It was 20 percent in 2010 and 2012 it is 27 percent. So basically it is helping the communities to reduce the waste in a stuff in landfill. It goes into the fuel and basically that converts and it is it is saving energy there. So mimics bio ecosystems where waste of one entity delivers value for another. So developing alternate energy sources, I mean CEMEX. Uh, as I have taken this example because if you are talking of green supply chain, there are varieties of ways in which you can you can reduce your carbon footprint. There are various alternatives you can create and I think CEMEX has done wonderfully well by using a biological waste into their kilns and also developing alternate energy sources. For example, CEMEX owns a wind farm in Mexico with a capacity to provide 25 percent of energy needed to run Mexican operations. And in 2011 allowed CEMEX to avoid 489-169 tons of CO2 emissions. So this is basically a kind of carbon trading. But instead of trading and then setting up the plant somewhere in, in some other country, in some other continent. What CEMEX does is whatever power it is needed, it generates through green alternatives like windmills. And CEMEX reduces carbon footprint by using efficient process technologies and changing the way it sources electricity. In 2011, CEMEX Philippines launched a collaborative project with Sinoma Energy Conversion Limited to devise a system for capturing waste heat from the kiln to produce clean alternative electricity. So now cement not only uses uh, this one, it has 1400 degrees centigrade, it operates. So there is lot of waste heat that is coming out from uh, the rotary kiln. Can you use that heat? to fire up your boilers to heat the boilers and then generate electricity and that is what they have been trying. So every means they are trying to, to generate uh, to generate uh, electricity or, or uh, use the waste as a fuel and so on. So if, if you look at the drivers of the green initiatives. So that is, I think that is where we have, we have looked at several examples so far, what are the initiatives that people are taking to drive up the green, this one. Before we go into the design in the next class, we, I have, I have presented to you various uh, innovations that uh, people are following, if you want to call them innovations or practices so that they can save, save uh, the, the energy. One is physical change in the environment is the basis for policy discussions. In other words, for any green environment, there is a lot of climate change, there is a lot of pollution and so on and health of people getting spoiled and that is a physical change in the environment and that creates regulation. So regulation in turn can affect development and availability of technology. In other words, once there is a regulation to, to reduce this, you devise new technologies. Regulation and availability of technology affect national and global markets because once there is a regulation for green markets, green products, you 
try to regulate this. And consumer habits and thus the demand for greener products can affect the way companies do business and encourage them to adopt new technologies that allow them to meet new consumer needs. So basically this whatever your examples you have seen they are basically coming from either social pressures or the government regulatory pressures or increases in the technology like solar energy. So you are using the increases in the technology and you are basically trying to counter the gas this one by coal fired uh, electricity generation and so on. So you can see this is a coevolution that happens from whatever happens through the green this one. So green versus customer value, no new carbon innovation will survive the marketplace if it fails to maximize the customer value along multiple dimensions. I think this is one thing that uh, all the green people should remember that you can produce a product and unless it delivers value to the customer whether it is green or not nobody is going to buy. In other words in addition to being green if it reduces less electricity, if it produces less water, some other benefit the customers won't buy. So reduction in carbon emission alone will not make car low carbon innovation successful in the marketplace. The innovations must also bring bottom line value in terms of total cost reduction, enhanced performance or competitive advantage. So the customer will ask all right you are following your regulations and you are producing green products. Now what is in it for me? Am I to use the same thing? Am I using less electricity, less water or am I getting the product at a cheaper cost? What is it? Just because it is a green and you are meeting the environmental regulations of the government, I cannot pay more price. That is what the customer will say. So what we are doing, uh, what, what we have done so far is in this two lectures is to look at the ecosystem of the green this one. What is happening in the world and what is it carbon trading and protocols and so on. So before we go into the, this one green supply chains is a very important subject that affects all the three sectors of the economy and also the livelihood, health and well-being of the humans and other species not given attention as yet. I mean the green supply chains are not given as much attention as the design. So green supply chain design is an important topic that deserves attention. It is across the board not only if you are in industry vertical it get food, agriculture, water services and so on. The mapping the entire green supply chain and see what are the alternatives that are available for its operation, for its use, generating the products and so on is an important this one. What we will do in the next class is how to design a green supply chain that what we do.